evening, everybody. This is Dick Darrell from the National Community Rights Network. And today we're discussion is uh, the theme is liberate yourself from the activist hamster wheel. So some of the topics that we'll be talking about, which were listed, is moral outrage, corporate harms in the corporate state, the regulatory shoot, the fixed regulatory system that encouraged prescribed participation, in the box of allowable act activism, and the uh, actions that will keep us spinning in the activist hamster wheel. And we will share why our misguided and programmed actions to ask for help and expect results from elected and other government officials do not stop the corporate harms in our community. So what we have for solutions is to liberate say, our, yourself and community from the fixed system that will be discussed using the community rights approach. So we tonight we have uh, on the community rights network we have Tom Groover, Dr. Tom Groover, Marky Miller from um, oh, Pennsylvania, or is it? Oh, I'm sorry, Ohio, <laughs> and Susie Byers Byersdorfer from Ohio, and Kara Scott from Pennsylvania. Thank you. And myself, Doug Darrell from New Hampshire. Where will we start um, with this conversation? Well, thank you, everyone. Uh, we want to start with an overview of the community rights organizing model and explain why this is important. And uh, one of the factors that we've talked about so far in our title is the activist hamster wheel and the liberation from that wheel. And I want to give you a personal example of that hamster wheel. And there are some other factors that will be d demonstrated by this story. And that is that <clears throat> in 1999, I was a candidate for State Board of Education here in Colorado. I'm speaking to you from my home in Superior, Colorado, Boulder, in Boulder County in Colorado. And um, I um, ran for State Board of Education that year, uh, this, the at-large seat, and I ran on the natural law party ticket, which is a ticket all about education for enlightenment, for higher consciousness, that, that education when conducted properly uh, makes people smarter. It raises their IQ, it makes them more alert and aware and more competent in other ways than just training to get to be a good employee for a corporation. It, it's about helping you to um, uh, evaluate the world and, you know, and to um, relate everything to the self. And so uh, one of the factors to having this uh, ability for higher consciousness is better is to have a good diet. And uh, the children, as we know, in, in uh, grade school are being fed a lot of poisonous government surplus food. I call it poisonous because I grew up on it. And, uh, and I remember going to the lunchroom and eating that stuff and then coming back to class and needing to go to sleep after eating it and uh, getting heartburn. And, you know, we all know the stories that we share about the mystery meat and other things that we consumed. And we have no idea what it was. And so um, we were gonna, a part of our platform was to have food that was nutritious, organic food. And I had a campaign in, in a high school here in Boulder, Colorado to replace all the commercial food with uh, locally grown organic and, and uh, n you know, other national products to, to switch over the pop machines to um, healthy beverages and to have uh, healthy organic snack foods in the, in the hallway there in these um, vending machines. And uh, one of the things also that we stood for at the time was uh, no genetically engineered foods in our diet. And, and we knew this was bad because um, one of our members had been a researcher and it actually developed genetic engineering technology uh, and was being offered a grant 
uh, by the a government grant for a million dollars to pursue this seriously. And he began to see what these big corporations had in mind. And he returned the million dollars to the government and closed his lab. So I thought I was very well qualified to speak on this subject because I had uh, had contact with the author of one of the first books on, gen on genetic engineering and I personally knew and had worked with uh, uh, the lawyer that, that sued the industry uh, for fraud, a public interest lawyer, and had been introduced to the topic because I'd sickened myself quite severely um, you know, from eating genetically engineered soy protein isolate and, um, and, and lecithin. So, um, so I was pretty well versed in the subject. And here in Boulder County, the uh, county government uh, rents out land to farmers and the farmers wanted to grow genetically engineered crops on that land. And the land is land that we paid for here. Uh, you know, our households have paid for it through taxes. And, uh, the, you know, so we felt like we had some ownership there and we had some say in the matter. So there was a big hearing that was advertised for the community to come and, and speak and testify uh, for or against genetic engineering. And, and I thought I was going to be the number one speaker. And I got there and there were scientists and brilliant genius types there uh, that spoke so eloquently, you couldn't really deny the argument against genetic engineering. So we went on until late at night and, uh, you know, we, my wife and I left early because, you know, it was like midnight or something and people were still going it on the subject. And the commissioners were sitting up there, but they sort of looked like they weren't paying a lot of attention. And I was worried about that. And so the next morning I get up, I can hardly wait. We run out into the driveway and get the newspaper to see what the outcome was because there was going to be a vote of the commissioners and and they voted to uh, plant GMOs on our public lands. And I was shocked. Now, that moment of shock is something that we call in our organizing model, the regulatory point. That's the point when you realize that you can't say no to something. And that's what we want to talk about right now is uh, what, first of all, start out with what motivates someone to, um, Take something on like that, you know. Why? Why would I go to a hearing like that? And um, why would I be involved in the follow-up to that, which was a, a grassroots movement to get the GMOs off the open space? So the the I'm going to show you like a, a path of of uh, organizing. It's like a roadmap, and it begins with uh, the fact that. Corporations have a tendency to be able to control us in our communities. They are able to get away with pretty much whatever they want. And so corporations control us and they um, are able to inflict harms upon us, communities and nature uh, against our will and to the detriment of nature and uh, if we were to listen carefully, we would probably get the message from nature that nature doesn't like it either. So we, we recognize the corporate harm. And in and, and Boulder County, it was very clear that people, uh, when we were organizing a, a campaign, was done to do um, a survey. And it was found that 90 something percent of the people didn't want GMOs on our open spaces. So how can this be? We elect these officials, we vote for them, and, and they go against our will. So what really is going on here? And this is where the, the hamster wheel begins. So we have these corporate harms, and, and we recognize them, and we are outraged. We have um, this sense that, you know, this is a huge injustice. You know, this is not right. Um, it's apparent. It's obvious to us. And but the rest of the, you know, the system that we're working in in government and law and economics, it doesn't recognize the moral outrage. So we think that maybe, you know, we're just not communicating properly. Maybe they're just not 
aware of it, we need to make them aware of it. We need to educate our elected officials. And we need to ask them then for help. So we start out and we say, no, this is not going to happen. I'm going to take it on myself. And some of us are geared up for taking these things on. That's our personality, I guess. And uh, so what we do is we say, no, we're going to do something about it. We're going to positively stop it. So then <clears throat> we go to our elected officials and explain the situ situation to them, and they're very polite, <clears throat> and they thank us for our visit and everything. And, but they say, we're sorry, our hands are tied. We can't do anything to help. Uh, you'll have to go uh, um, you know, to the state level. This is a state matter. And so we go to our state elected officials and we ask them for help and they thank us very much. And, um, you know, they, they tell us eventually um, that really their hands are tied. We really can't do anything about this. It's uh, their laws in place that prevent them from helping us really. So we're, we're bound to figure out a way to say no. So we're, we're not going to give up on this. And then at some point we start getting, pressed in a direction where we take a detour from say no. And we want to, um, we, our community itself uh, wants to pursue ways of stopping this corporate harm that are legal and, and established. And, and uh, what, we, what, what is considered the legitimate way of doing things. So this detour from saying no is that we want to go and make agreements with the corporations, the, the, uh, the system that we're working under, um, you know, our relationship with our government and the legal system and the corporations is that we have like three main avenues available to us. We can go and make agreements, excuse me, <coughs> agreements with the corporations uh, for them to do whatever it is they're doing but to do it in a way that's maybe a little less harmful. And uh, an uh, example of that is what's happening here in Colorado with a community, late, uh, Erie, Colorado, where the fracking companies have come in and said, oh, well, we're going to do this. Uh, there's nothing you can do about it. Uh, we have the law on our side. And uh, so if you'll sign this memorandum of understanding, we'll, you know, maybe instead of putting the fracking wells in your right in your backyard next to your kitchen window we'll move them away from the house just a little bit more make it easier for you so that's the memorandum of understanding and um, that's what happens when we negotiate with corporations another uh, strategy that's used is trying to manipulate zoning rules to say that we just don't have any zoning category for, you know, GMO farming or fracking wells or, you know, spraying pesticides on the forest around our community to beat back the kill the weeds and the bugs so that the trees can grow. So zoning really doesn't work because zoning, you know, like in, in New York State, they're using a zoning uh, ordinance to to, to ban fracking, but the reality is it's a, it's a statute and statutes are changed all the time by the elected officials. So if, uh, if, the, if the fracking companies want it bad enough and pay these officials enough to make the change, they'll make the change and New York will be fracked. So those are the two first things that are usually tried, but then there's another, try, another way of uh, doing this and this is what we call the regulatory shoot. And the regulatory shoot is uh, we, in our minds, we shape it like a, a, a triangle, it just like a cattle shoot, where the it starts out being a very open uh, space in which the cattle are directed, and it narrows down till eventually the cattle are coming through the shoot in single file. And so we have this regulatory shoot, and uh, and what happens is it takes us uh, a while to go through this regulatory shoot. Um, so here we are, we have the corporate harms, and then we've got the picture of the shoot here. And when, when we get into the regulatory shoot, um, 
community groups are herded from a focus on saying no to a harm uh, inflicted upon them by the corporations. And, and they're driven into dealing with the regulatory agencies. And uh, these agencies are sort of a trap because uh, they're really there to uh, regulate the rate and extent of the harm. They're not there to prevent the harm from taking place. They, they basically are going to be there to argue parts per million of the poisoning of your water or your air or your earth or your food or whatever it is the corporation wants to do. And so it, it uh, pushes you into changing your focus and negotiating that rate and extent of corporate harm. Also, uh, we could say the regulatory shoot is like, um, you know, lobbying legislators, trying to meet with them privately and talk about it and get them on our side and, you know, what we don't realize is that they've been already met by the corporate uh, regulatory people and uh, you know, they're on board with them pretty much. So what happens is that we go to these elected officials and we go to the corporations and we say, oh, please don't hurt us. Please don't allow them to hurt us. And they say, well, what you should really do is just go to this hearing and the, the hearing is like a commission sitting in front of you at a, you know, up on the, t you know, elevated dais, you know, looking down upon you like some gods and, and you plead with them and beg, please don't frack our community. Please don't spray the pesticides on us. Okay. And so um, you go to this hearing, that's what that is. And the um, local officials really encourage us to go to the hearing so that we can voice our concerns that, so we can have a voice in our government. Uh, we go to our elected officials at the state level and they do the same. Uh, our culture is geared for us to, to follow these very polite rules to go to these hearings and, and plead and beg. And when we go, we might dress up in funny costumes to kind of shock people. We might, you know, have a dye in during the hearing and smear ourselves with blood or we might carry weird posters or wear uh, wear provocative t-shirts or funny hats or whatever it is, you know, to try and put on a show and impress uh, the, the, our audience up at the top, at the front of the hearing. Uh, so the lawyer, if we have a, a lawyer, an environmental lawyer, for instance, who, um, uh, you know, wants to uh, help us or we're paying to help us, you know, They'll say, oh, go to the hearing, I'll go there with you, you know, I'll help you, you know, I'll help you with your testimony or, you know, uh, that, that sort of thing. And um, the corporations themselves, if we meet with some corporate head or representative of a corporation, you know, they'll say, oh, well, you know, we're having a hearing and we'd really like to hear you voice your concerns in public like that and have them, you know, put on the record. Um, the media is really big on hearings. They want you to go to the hearing and, and uh, environmental groups are great at taking you to hearings. The, the main purpose of environmental groups that we see, the conventional ones, like the big green uh, groups, what we call the AstroTurf groups, is that they want you to go to the hearing. They want to help you organize your posters and your signs and your costumes and your testimony. And they also want to help you lobby your elected officials. And so they're really good at sitting at the negotiating table with you and discussing parts per million. But they're not good at, if you start talking about banning something, uh, they get really upset and uh, you know they're gonna try and talk you out of it or they're gonna run the other way. So eventually you hear so much about going to this hearing and, and are pressured into doing it really uh, just out of, you know, our own sense of, uh, of insecurity, we go to the hearing. So what we do is we stand up there and give our brilliant testimony and you might have every single person there, you know, uh, opposed to the harm that the corporations want to do to your community or your state. And, uh, and the, the officials hear what you have to say and then next what happens is this experience of this regulatory point. 
So you've made a convincing argument. You think you've done a really good job. You, you wrote up the best posters and signs. You're, everything was really well staged. Uh, your die-in was just impeccable. You got it on video. Uh, the newspapers were there. They saw it. You know, it was really, wow, wow, you know. And then so what you find out is, you know, you get up the next morning and read the newspaper and find out that the commission decided to go ahead and do it anyway, even though, you know, you were 100% or 85% opposed to it in the group. And so it's like in the cattle shoot instance, the, the cow goes through to the point where it's single file and he's into this room alone with a, with a handler who picks up a, a, a gun and, and shoots a bolt through its brain. So that's this point right here, the singular regulatory point. Now the singular regulatory point, at that point, the original problem and solution is now defined by the corporate state. So we live in a corporate state rather than a community. You know, we don't have a relationship really with our government, our corporations in our country do. And uh, the regulations are the only thing that are discussed and, and the harms are then legalized by the state. And so we get plow, we get plastered in the head and uh, it blows the wind out of our sails. We've used up all our resources. I mean, a lot of us have dipped deep into our own personal finances. We've spent all kinds of time. We put our families on the back burner. We put our careers on the back burner and we've hit the pavement and we've worked our tails off for what? And so uh, we just went into the hamster wheel and uh, the reason we call it the hamster wheel is because this scenario is acted on over and over and over again by activists throughout this time. Um, and, they, and, it's, and it's done with many, many, many different individual harm issues that are, that are present in our world. So it could be saving the wolves, it could be regulating the, um, the amount of uh, you know, pesticides or trying to ban GMOs or, or fracking or pipelines or you name it. The, uh, probably in this country, the first uh, people to experience the regulatory shoot were the you know, indigenous population. So um, let's, let's look at this now. Uh, basically, we start saying no and we take this detour into either corporate agreements, zoning efforts, or we go down this regulatory shoot. And uh, what we find is that this is the regulatory system. This is the way that we're supposed to behave. And the regulatory system is harmful because it does not allow us, as long as we're participating in this system, we cannot say no. So now we wanna move on to uh, another way of approaching this, and that is how to actually abolish this corporate state and begin to govern ourselves. Because what's really happening is that the corporations and their elected representatives the people who paid for them to stay in office, they don't represent us and they govern us. We don't govern them. So here over here on the left, we have this whole regulatory system, but what we're recommending is community rights organizing. Community rights organizing starts with rights-based principles and rights are primordial. They are inalienable, meaning that they're there all the time. They've been there all along. They'll always be there. They were there when you were born into the world. They'll, you can't give them away. You, you can't be they can't be taken from you. Uh, you know, you can't sell them or give them away. You can't really lose them. You can allow them to be trampled on. They can be violated, but you can take them back. And so they're inalienable. They're fundamental to life. Things like clean air, clean water, clean earth, you have to have those to live a healthy life. And the question I have for all of us is, are we born on this planet in order to be able to live just a half healthy life or should we be fully healthy? They're universal. They apply to everyone equally. Nobody has more uh, rights than other people. And they're eternal. They're absolute. 
they're omnipresent. They've always been, they're everywhere. Now, let me make something clear when I talk about this, this rights-based organizing. All right, so there's a big difference between established legal rights that have been negotiated through the you know, legislative process with parliamentarians and lawyers. You know, those are man-made laws. The rights that we're speaking about are fundamental. They're inalienable. They're not something you can negotiate. They're there. They only need to be recognized, clarified, enumerated, you know, put in law, and they have to be uh, enforced. And the people who will enforce them are not going to be the corporations and the corporate state. It's going to have to be us. Now, here's the thing that we need to understand when we consider our analysis of the need for uh, community rights organizing. We have a box here, and that box is what we call the box of allowable activism. If we're working in the system, in the established system of, 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 of organizing and activism, we have to stay in this box. Our community has to stay put. So here's our community in the box. And it's kept in that box as long as we follow along the principles of the basic legal doctrines that are there to keep us confined. So they keep us in the box, and the first one is called Dillon's Rule, which means that uh, it's a legal philosophy that, me that says that our communities are children of the state, and we can't do anything unless we're given permission by the state to do it. So in effect, we can't write our own laws to protect the health and safety and the welfare for our people, communities, and nature without permission from the state. Also, there's state preemption, and that is that if we were to write something that is opposed to what the state would prefer, in other words, we wanna regulate or we wanna ban fracking from our community or ban GMOs, or ban a pipeline and we write a law for it, the state will say, I'm sorry, you don't have the authority. That's a state matter. We have the authority only and we're nullifying your law. That's called state preemption. There's also a, a whole system of corporate personhood rights, which put person, which, push, which make corporations persons and give them rights which are greater than those of ourselves and and our, our communities. Um, these corporate rights have made their way, they've been found, they've been discovered in our constitution, the constitution of this nation. And, and um, so that, you know, you, you, you know they have uh, immunity, they, they have to be treated fairly. You know, they can't be, they can't, you know, like people in communities can't have, you know, a different set of rights than they do. And, and so, um, you know, they also, um, uh, you know, part of the whole game of this regulatory system is to treat nature as property. So that if you have more nature, if you own more nature, or you're in control of more nature, uh, more property, um, you know, you can destroy more nature. Um, there's also the corporate commerce rights that allow corporations to do make profits across state lines. So if you do something that uh, prevents a corporation from making profits, they can sue you for the damages. You know, if you try and enforce, uh, uh, you know, constant, you know, your own rights uh, for yourself and your community, thinking that you have the the right to freedom of speech or or that you know above corporations, um, you know, you can get in trouble with the corporations, and certainly if you interfere with their their ability to, um, to use property uh, that they consider theirs, uh, you can get in trouble with the corporations and be held liable. So how do we deal with this? Well, um, we recognize first that this is a box. This is a box that's created by the corporate state and it puts us into behaving in a predictable way and we follow a script that they've written for us and as long as we follow that script, they get what they want and we get screwed. So here we have this community rights organizing. The first thing is to become knowledgeable about our rights and how they're being violated. Now, the next thing that we need to do then is begin to create our own system of law 
that's independent from that whole system. And to put it into, into our communities, uh, if we can, put it in our charters or put it, put it in our statutes. And so here we have our lawmaking and these concentric circles are, the, are representing the layers of protection that we have uh, written into our laws. Now, <coughs> in our community rights movement, we use a specific law firm to do this. Who, this law firm has been doing this for 20 years called the Community Environmental Legal Defense Fund. And they're really good at this. And they're the ones that we've used here in Lafayette, Colorado to ban fracking. Uh, you know, we, it's been preempted by the state. So, you know, then the next thing, and there's a lot to the story and we won't go into it now. But um, that in some ways is a good thing. And we'll explain that in our, in our discussion after this. We're just about to wrap it up, but let me show you this. We have a community bill of rights and a bill of rights is a, is a list of rights. You know, clean air, clean water, clean earth, freedom from chemical trespass, the right to local self-government, the right to ban things, to prohibit things that violate those rights and the right to enforce those rights, okay? So uh, we kind of get those elected through um, initiative, circulate a petition, get all the signatures, get it on the ballot and vote for it. And in Lafayette, you know, we passed our community bill of rights for banning fracking by 60%, okay? So that's how we got it in the books. But also your, if you don't have that ability to initi of initiative, you can have your elected officials, uh, you know, they can adopt it as an ordinance. Um, in, in New Hampshire, for instance, at the state level, uh, they can, the elected officials are in the process of considering adopting a community rights amendment to the, to the state of New Hampshire's constitution. So there's ways of getting these into the books and we build in four layers of protection. So the first layer is that we write laws that nullify Dillon's rule and then we um, nullify state preemption with our laws and we take away the corporate commerce rights and we, um, we take away corporate personhood and we take away this uh, principle of nature as property and nature then becomes um, something very essential and fundamental to life. It becomes life itself. So those are, those are, those are our community bills of rights. That's kind of what they look like. And we adopt them into local law and then we have to enforce those laws. Now that enforcement part is really important to understand. So we can enforce these laws and you know, we put them in the books and then our elected officials can you know, make sure they're enforced by using our police to, um, to enforce them. So if, if some corporation comes and tries to spray pesticides in our forest next to our water supply, they can, and they can arrest them and fine them. Uh, uh, it, you know, if, if the local officials don't enforce them, usually we build into our laws um, a clause that says that the local people can enforce them independent of the elected officials should they fail to do so. And some of our laws now are starting to say that we can, that, w that we legalize uh, direct action enforcement of our local laws. Um, you can uh, also build in and do initiative for um, amending your state constitution to give communities the right to local self-government. And that backs up your enforcement of your, your community bills of rights. Now, in order to accomplish this, it can't be done by a small group of people. And it's certainly not going to happen, if, you know, someone important, it's quote, important, end quote, is not going to be the one to do this. It's really going to have to be the grassroots have to be the local people. And it's to require a huge collective effort of many people all over the country doing these kind of things because it's a form of legal disobedience. It's civil disobedience because the law is bolstered to make these, these kinds of efforts, um, you know, illegitimate in the eyes of established law. And what we recognize is that established law itself is completely illegitimate because it doesn't recognize these inalienable rights anywhere really in any form in any substantial way so because the uh, the legal system and the courts and the 
the the the legislation are all all about you know protecting corporate rights to property and 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 commerce you know and uh, and ignoring the rights of people to have health safety and welfare we say that the existing system of law and government uh, is illegitimate we're going to have to have a cl collective uprising really what it comes to a form of revolution and we have to stop begging for reform. And, uh, you know, we have to have uncompromising exertion of community power. In other words, we have to stand up and say no ourselves. We can say no. It's just that we are not going to be able to count on our elected officials to protect us and say no for us. We have to have the unerring goal of securing and enforcing our fundamental rights and the removal of systemic violations of those rights. Now, these, these uh, four fundamental principles of building a people's movement, defining actual movement, uh, were written by a man named Ben, ben Price, who is a very helpful uh, a member of the Community Environmental Legal Defense Fund, who's helped us in our efforts to write and and get our our community bills of rights enacted so this is what we're talking about with a movement and when people call something a movement our definition of movement means that it has to meet these four criteria and most movements that are called movements today don't because they're not addressing the systematic pro the systemic problems that exist in the very core DNA of the way our laws are working. They don't address the, the federal and state constitutions and the local laws. They're mostly just begging for crumbs off the corporate table, trying to get a better deal once, uh, once uh, these um, corporate projects are coming in. So that's enough for me talking right now. I think what we want to do now is move on to a question and answer uh, session here. And we have a, um, we're very fortunate to have members of our, um, our board of directors for the uh, community rights, the National Community Rights Network on board here. The Kansas Constitution provides for home rule for communities, but not counties. Should, how should we proceed? In Pennsylvania, we do have home rule for counties. There's a, there's a fellow on there, Al Beecher, that said that they do. He says yes. They do in Kansas. Yeah. Yeah. So um, just let me give you, um, and uh, Al says uh, they have home rule in Maine. Right. We have it in Colorado. It's written in our state constitution that uh, we have the right to home rule. And uh, Dorothy says, uh, what is home rule? <laughs> and home rule is, uh, is a authority that's given to communities um, and to counties. Uh, and um, what it allows us to do is once we've uh, established home rule, um, usually done through citizen initiative, you have to petition your population and put this um, home rule charter together. And a home rule charter is like a constitution for your community. And so the community is then supposed to be able to uh, then enact its own laws uh, to protect health, safety, and welfare, basically, um, and uh, not be violated by state preemptions and by corporate rights. And uh, so that was the initial intention for home rule. Uh, here in Colorado, um, many of our communities have been through that process where they wrote their own charters, got them elected, and uh, changed their form of government from what's called a statutory government, which is basically government by the state, to this home rule form of government where the people are supposed to be governing themselves. But that principle has been eroded very severely through um, uh, judicial precedent. These judges don't like it very much, and so they rule against it. And once you have that precedent, then you can't really enforce your home rule very well anymore because uh, corporations take you to court 
And then a judge says, well, it's uh, it, right here. This was overturned before. We're going to have to overturn it again because we have a legal precedent. So, Tom, I um, think that moving on to the question about Grant Township yes, kind of goes go into the home rule a little bit as well in the sense that they became a home rule community. <clears throat> Things specifically happening in Grant Township, Crystal. Um, first of all, this is a good and a bad thing in the sense that it really demonstrates that the corporations have superseded our rights at a level that's beyond what we can manage and other than to really point it out that this is this community has done everything they can do. So they were they became a home rule community after they wanted to put an ejection wells in for 700 people that had well water. So they decide they're going to put a Seneca resources decides to put an injection well in their water hole, basically. Grant Township says no way. We're not doing that's not going to happen. They they fought it in the court and lost. The following week, they had an election in which home rule was put up to the people and they won unanimously. Now, what happened since then is a crazy nutshell of events. The DEP wound up suing Grant Township. There's an interesting chain of events in behalf of the oil and gas industry. And now the judges ruling that they do not have the right to become home rule because they are a ward of the state. So we have a lot of legal things that are going on now that are changing the entire paradigm of how we respond to these issues that I think is a real interesting way that we need to focus on it. The, the principle of home rule has been eroded and that's part of what our community rights movement is about, is mm -hmm. to point out the contradictions in our form of government. So now As the home rule movement started back at a time when our elected officials were, you know, just total sluts. You know, they, they were a bunch of drunken SOBs that, um, you know, were just trying to exploit all people, all nature, everything for, for their own profits. And, uh, you know, they're, they're, um, the people rose up and, uh, you know, put home rule into their state charters, their, their constitutions. And, but uh, we had, they need to be honored, you know, and here in lies the question is when the, when the state and federal government doesn't honor the home rule charter, this is what's going to educate us to the fact that we really do not have the right to say no. And therefore that moves more towards the revolutionary perspective in how do we, how do we roll with that? I wanted to add that another part of the activist hamster wheel is thinking that if we uh, get a good person elected, that we can have, you know, big positive changes. But the problem is, is in a fixed system, you can get good people, but they're often silenced, bullied, or bought off or eventually bought off by corporations that actually write the laws that regulate them. So we talk about the system not really being broken, but be, being fixed, a fixed system with the corporations and the state government. In and, so, and you know what, Susie, I think that's a really good point. And maybe it's a matter of just a lot of people running for elections. That's why I'm running for elections. That's why I'm running for the state representative position because, and creating a candidate forum with seven other candidates in the state of Pennsylvania to create a coalition where we're already in agreement before we get elected on how we'd move forward if we do. That to me is an out of the box way to, to work with these things. What if we all stood up and ran for election? Yeah, and local and local official uh, local elected officials also very important. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. I'm just going to give a shout out to Lynn and all the 
wonderful activists in Youngstown, Ohio, that we don't lose until we quit. And we've uh, put bills mm -hmm. of rights on the ballot for six times. The seventh time they weren't allowed on the ballot, but we're going back in May. So um, again, the, the, we believe that we have the right to do that. Here's a good question. Um, are there comments on Ecuador and what they've done for rights of nature? Should we move that way? And uh, so Marky is, is working on a big project right now to give uh, the rights of nature to Lake Erie. Uh, Marky, can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know if I can say much for Ecuador, but um, I, can definitely speak on behalf of Lake Erie. And I think moving in that way is, it's also a way of recognizing that we're not just saving something uh, because we're passionate about nature, but you know, it, it's, it's our own means of survival as well. And, and as far as using community rights, you know, how, you have to decide how much time are you gonna spend and how much energy are you gonna spend on trying to do things the same way and, and watching how they've, not been that successful. Um, I just came out of an environmental science graduate program and it's like we're, we're just learning about a lot of failed attempts and but we're not being taught new ways to fix things. So I absolutely see rights of nature as, as a way we could move forward and you know all kinds of um, environmental problems and, and trying to solve that because at some point something's not working. So I'm, I'm excited to see that happen for Lake Erie, and I, I hope it continues to grow around not only Ohio, but other, um, other communities that are based around the lake. The, um, it, we have our own YouTube channel called the National Community Rights Network. Uh, you can find us on YouTube there if you log in and do that search for National Community Rights Network. And you'll see that, that um, we just published a video and there's an article about this up on our website about the Lake Erie project that Marky's been working on. And one of our panelists for that um, interview is a lawyer, Will Falk. And Will was involved in a campaign to give the rights of nature to legally and put it in law that, you know, the, the Colorado River has the, the right to exist, regenerate, and to flourish. And, uh, you know, that was a campaign that was moving ahead. And it's very interesting, the um, corporate state is so terrified of things like this right now because of their power. And so the way they're stopping us now is by sanctioning our attorneys that help us with these campaigns. So we had an attorney here in Colorado, you know, that's a, just a, I think he's a single person practice that was working on this with them. And the attorney general for the state of Colorado uh, threatened him with sanctions if he didn't stop doing this, this illicit behavior, that he was being a bad boy and he was gonna get a spanking if he didn't quit. And so the, the, the lawyer had to withdraw the case because you know, he couldn't afford to lose his license and be fined and, you know, and he has a family he has to support. So that was something interesting and that gives us some information about uh, what's going on you know, and it educates the people too of our world that um, you know, we, don't, we never did have a democracy, we don't live in a democracy and the corporate state has a stranglehold on power right now, and that we're gonna to have to stand up and take it back for ourselves, because nobody's gonna do it for us. And then, uh, Kara, can you talk a little bit about the sanctions that are going on around that Grant Township legal suit? Seldef lawyers are sanctioned. There were two, two of them at this point in time, it's still in process. In response to, everything, they're taking the wind out of the sails by sanctioning the lawyers. So right now it's up in the air. We don't know what's going on. I know that they're looking to appeal the decision is what I've last heard. But that's pretty much what I know right now. Right. It's, um, that's the direction that the state, the corporate state is taking now is to halt us 
by denying access to the ballot, by, um, you know, setting up all these artificial rules that we have to follow in order to even get anything on the ballot for the communities to vote on them. And, um, and then when we do get something going, uh, then the, the lawyers that we use to help us navigate through the legal system are sanctioned and taken out of action. Well, this so, is the, that Dodge Perry rule. They're gonna, we're gonna act, they react. Then we react. And we have to look at out of box ways that are going to keep flowing forward so that we can think outside of the box and find a way to respond. Hopefully without the revolution, but if we can, but we still have to keep moving on it. We still keep have it, having to take every one of these examples and use them as, as a reason. See, see, look, now we've tried to go things by the law and here we are stopped again. Is this legal? No. Is this reasonable? No. Do we have rights? No. What do we do about it now? Right. And you see uh, William Lyon's question about, is our success ultimately determined by the ruling of judges? And I think a lot of us, you know, feel that it needs to get into the courts so that our constitution can be looked at in 21st century ways and not, and as Tom had uh, quipped the other night, that we're still in a feudal system that doesn't, um, you know, allow our rights, you know, to be inalienable. So right now that is what happens is, I mean, it's certainly in Youngstown and other uh, communities and counties in the state of Ohio, uh, that's where we end up. We w end up in the courts. Yeah. So let's go back to the, the principles of civil disobedience the things that have been changed in the present constitution, which have given, which abolished the slaves, which gave women the right to vote, th that was accomplished uh, through civil disobedience. Because there were laws that prevented women from voting, but the women went ahead and voted anyway. And there were so many of them doing it that uh, eventually, the corporate state had to give in and recognize women as people and that they would have uh, the right to vote. And the same is true with slavery. And uh, the civil rights movement was civil, was peaceful civil disobedience that, um, you know, allowed the black people to um, be able to join you know, be, be to enroll in schools that were previously segregated and sit at lunch counters and in buses in with everyone else rather than to have to be separated or, you know, forced into sitting in the back of the bus. And so, I, yeah, go ahead, Kara. I'm sorry, Tom. I just think that that's a really good point. And the thing is, everything that they did was great and it's happened through time from Gandhi's, you know, starvation to the singing revolution to everybody had their own niche for the time of what they did to really make a movement. Two things that, that I'd like to respond to on that is, first of all, it never, once, once they got what they wanted, it kind of stopped, the movement stopped. And yet the problem still persisted. And we need, you know, we cannot drop the fight. It has to continue beyond the civil disobedience and beyond, okay, yay, we got the right to vote. Does that mean there's not misogyny? Does that mean that, that we're, you know, equal in everybody's mind? No. Does that mean that races are all equal in everybody's mind? No. We have to continue that fight is the one thing. But the other thing is... We need to leverage our own way of, of managing this, of our own way of dealing with it instead of repeating what's been done and, and find a different mechanism for how we get our message across and 
and to build the people behind it. Yeah, and our suggestion is the way to do that is to meet in our own communities and sit together and think together and speak together and come up with our own assessment of what's happening in our own locales and then uh, utilizing the principles of behavior and activism that would that will give us greater rights to 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 establish those rights and to enforce those rights from that point on so you're right the follow through is so important mm -hmm. and we can't just enact a community bill of rights and then say oh we did it and then just walk away you right, know, we yeah. might be required to actually stand in front of the the fracking trucks to enforce those rights. Well, and the thinking about it is the first step, but then it has to, we have to figure out what the next action is. Yes. Yeah, so now there's one final question we should probably um, uh, look at now, and, and it's from Bob Hoffman. Can you repeat the response to the question about how to address lack of home rule and municipal and county level? Would you please repeat the response to the question? Thomas asked about addressing a lack of home rule at the municipal or county level in the state constitution. And you know, that's sort of an individual question. So now in some states you have the right to initiative and some you don't. You know, like New Hampshire, you don't. You don't have the right to initiative at the state level. And so you have to beg the, the um, you know, the legislators to sponsor a bill to create, you know, some amendment that you want to have done. And that's the way it's written. And so, you know, it's up to the people in New Hampshire to figure out how to put home rule into their charter, you know, into their constitution or into their town city charters if they're not there. And they've also made it real challenging to establish home rule. Yeah. By you have to create a board to, to discuss what the charter is going to be. They have to be voted on. It, I mean, it's a long process to get, at least in Pennsylvania, you don't just sign up and say, I want to be home rule. You have to go through an entire process to get there and it becomes very difficult. And the, some of the, downsides of the home rule is that it doesn't sometimes it's no better than zoning it depends on how this those supervisors pull that together on how strong that home rule charter is for protecting rights anyways well i know there were questions about whether states have initiative rights and we will be putting something out either tomorrow or the next day on our website i don't have the link right in front of me it's a ballotpedia if you were to google you know which states have initiative rights you could find that there's only um 26 that do have the rights uh, of initiative and even there uh, it is a long and very uh, huge undertaking. In Ohio, we just were approved uh, to put two state amendments on the ballot after we collect over 330,000 valid signatures. So uh, we do have a campaign going on for that. But um, please go to our website, Facebook page, and, you know, let's just keep connecting up. This is a good start. Susie, could you announce the need for giving uh, New Hampshire national recognition for the work they're doing through sending um, uh, uh, communications to the legislators there? Yes, that will also be on our website. We do have a, a newsletter and you can sign up on our website for that. And, uh, New Hampshire will be putting forward a um, it's called CACR 19 and it's a resolution they don't they don't have the right of initiative so they have to go through a committee and a committee will recommend what's called OTP ought to pass and then from that committee the um, amendment would be put into the Senate and the House and if they both approved 
then it would go on the ballot for a vote of the citizens. So I know I've been involved um, for a number of years here. And I know in 2016, they met with another committee at the state level and uh, were denied their the right to go on. So we urge people to go to the New Hampshire Community Rights Network's uh, website, which is new, um, nhcommunityrights.org. And on their website, they have a place where you can uh, call up an email and uh, send in written testimony that just says that you support the right of citizens to determine whether they have local control in their communities. Very good. Well, thank you, everyone. We appreciate your attendance. And uh, uh, we will uh, want to hear back from you. We're considering the possibility of doing more webinars in the future. And uh, if you like this activity that we're doing here, if you could let us know so we can evaluate uh, the, the need and the desire for, for, for doing webinars. So thank you very much and uh, all the best. Bye-bye.